On this episode, we chat to Bu Buntanakit about his prolific career as an actor and singer in Thailand. So if you want the inside scoop on the life of a multi-talented Thai performer, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. And welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 because the little town I came from already had a tall, handsome, chubby, gregarious class clown. And you know how it goes. Out come the pitchforks. There can be only one, Greg. <laughs> nice, nice reference. <laughs> and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 22 years ago. Fell in love with explaining to my Thai students... No, smiling does not count as class participation, so I never left. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. If you ask your students what their hobbies are, what would they say? That is a good question. Ah, interesting. This is fascinating. I, I, I feel like, do, am I wrong in, in saying that I feel like hobbies are not as popular here as they are in the West? I, I feel like back home, everyone has some hobby. And I do, I do know a few of my students, like I had a... One of my favorite students of all time, she was really into calligraphy. But I remember when she showed me her calligraphy, I was just like, wow, I I don't know. Like, I don't, it's a good question. That, that's a really good, maybe we can explore this in another show. It's Thai a bit of a, hobbies, Thai hobbies, I love it. It's a great topic. It's a bit of a loaded question for me because when I was teaching back in the day, I would always ask my students, and I've said this on the show before, uh, what is your favorite hobby? And without a doubt, they would all say in unison, sleep, eat, watch TV. It was like oh, funny! <laughs> it was like a cheer, and that's, I always used to great. sleep, eat, watch TV, and you're sleep, like, oh, eat, "That's not TV. really a hobby." You're like, "That's not really what I mean." <laughs> it sounds like the beginning of a, a Bay City Roller song: "Sleep, eat, watch TV, Saturday night." <laughs> but um, I used to tell them like, it. "That's those aren't hobbies; those are lack of hobbies. Like that's what you do when you're bored, right?" So anyway, <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, they might say eating. You know, that's what I'm afraid right, of. You're right. right. They might say eating. <laughs> Uh, all right, but that, that's a good that's a good future topic. Uh, tangent there, yeah. All right, we want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get our ad-free regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos of our interviews, a heads-up to send questions to upcoming guests, and access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about Bangkok's absolutely disgusting air for the past few weeks and the toll it takes on your physical and mental health. The recent story of a Taiwanese actress who was extorted by the Thai police for having a vape pen and then wasn't and then was, depending on who you talk to. My recent day trip to Pattaya to sunbathe on a lovely catamaran and discussion about Burger King's latest offering in Thailand, the Chocolate Whopper. To learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. Man, I love chocolate and I love Whoppers, but that might be a bridge too far. <laughs> ne never the twain shall meet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. As always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we can use on the show. All right. Well, in this episode, Ed interviews Thai actor and singer Sahajak Bu Buntanakit about his life growing up in Kenya and America and his eventual career as a singer and actor here in the Land of Smiles. A veteran performer of the legendary Tawandang Brewery in Bangkok, love that place, Kun Bu has acted in dozens of films, culminating in a role in Ron Howard's film 13 Lives, chronicling the cave rescue drama in the summer of 2018. He's had a fascinating and unexpected life story and is a genuinely fun and friendly guy who just happens to be one of Thailand's most prolific and talented performers. I met Bo and he's a wonderfully cool dude. So here is Ed's conversation with Sahajak Bo Untanaki. All right, folks, I'm uh, here live at the garage on uh, Sukhumit Road. We're kind of um, opposite Soy 49. Uh, the garage is a very cool kind of American-style burger joint, and I'm with my buddy, Sahajak Buntakit, who I'm just going to call Boo from now on. Uh, Boo, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on the podcast. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a uh, an honor, a delight. So, Boo, I was originally going to just talk about your recent films, but your life story is so fascinating. Uh, why don't you give us some background? Um, so, you were actually born in Thailand, is that correct? Correct. Uh, born in Thailand, 1959. Gotcha. And uh, lucky enough that my father was uh, the smarter one in the family, so he uh, uh, was with the government uh, uh -huh. in the diplomatic corps and was transferred to Nairobi, Kenya. In 1966. So you were you were quite young. So you're, you're basically a, a, a diplomatic kid, and uh, we've actually had diplomatic kids on the show before. You guys tend to move around a lot. Uh, somewhat. Uh, although my movement was only to two countries, I think they were the ones that really, uh, because of the, the amount of time I spent there, they're the ones that uh, shaped my life. So Absolutely. as a kid, you're a Thai kid who was in Thai schools, and then all of a sudden you're in Africa, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? Was it for you as a kid? Did you think, wow, this is a cool adventure or was it was it difficult? You know, I, I believe uh, any change is uh, is uh, not welcome at first. Uh, but I think if you learn to live with it and learn to find the good of it, you will you will like it. I first went to Nairobi at the age of seven and couldn't speak English. Uh, I think we would like the I want to believe we were the only Asians there uh, amongst all the locals, the blacks, the Indians, and then, of course, what they called themselves, the colonials or whatever they were there, the British. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we were, we were like the odd man out. And, but after a while, I assimilated, and I just thought I was one of the locals. Gotcha. Now, you were in some kind of uh, uh, international school. You, said, you mentioned to me earlier, it was a no, Catholic school. No, I was not, yeah. Uh. I was in a local Catholic school called St. Teresa's I see. Boys School. Yeah. So, so were most of your classmates then uh, African? Correct. Interesting. So what, <laughs> how, what, what was that like for you? Was it just, did you just roll with it being young? Like, did, was there, did you feel discrimination against you as Asian? Because you, you were the outsider. So that's inter just an interesting story. You know, I'm, I'm sure discrimination, uh, racism, whatever has been in, in our... Uh, midst for every and every amen, but no, I, 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 but because I was different from them, whenever there was a conflict or an argument or whatever, of course it would come out, oh, you, Bruce Lee. You know? Oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. And then I would have to do a Bruce Lee on them. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's how I, I earned my respect. <laughs> but but the bottom line is you adjusted and you, you mostly had a good childhood, but it sounds like. I did. I loved it. Uh, till today, Nairobi remains... Uh, home in my heart oh fascinating yes. oh that's a great that's a great story now you mentioned to me earlier that your dad ended up getting eventually getting transferred to the states why don't you, why don't you tell me about that well yeah you know after 11 years in nairobi i think my father always thinking of his family thought that maybe we should see the the bigger side of the world the wherever everything was happening so he managed to get himself transferred to New York, where he took uh, one of my brothers uh, and myself. And after three years, only three years, he passed away, and I continued to stay there. Yeah. For okay. So you years. ended up. So now, do you remember going to the states at the time? Were you excited to do that? Or were you or, like you sounded like you were pretty happy in, in Nairobi? I was, and because the first of everything happened there, uh, right? So I still have friends there. Okay. Uh, I lost my virginity there, you know, so. <laughs> so you can't forget that. You know, I'm, it was the first of everything. So, but to go to New York the first night in the hotel, to have this box with all these numbers that you can change the, the, the channels of the TV and the TV was in color. Oh, and wow. Of course it was exciting. Oh, wow. <laughs> After all these years. Okay, so interesting. <laughs> so it was, it was a kind of a big step up just in terms of development and technology. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. And coming from Nairobi, where uh, if you just left your house and drove out 15 minutes, you were in the savanna. It wasn't the jungle of, of Kenya was not a jungle as you would see in a Tarzan movie or whatever. Right. It's you see some trees here and there, but you'll see giraffes, lions, if you're lucky, you know, and wow. all the, the wild animals that you can think of that that uh, belong to, to Kenya. But when you go to New York now, you're in a different jungle. Oh, what sure. What they call the, right? The, the concrete jungle, sure. The concrete jungle, absolutely. So that was, uh, 
quite a sight to be in the wind tunnel, to be blown away, just standing on, on an avenue on a street in Manhattan and have these big buildings. God, what, what a yeah. transition, man, yes. from Nairobi to New York. That, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit. So you, you, you told me before you went into work on all kinds of different jobs, but as a young kid, you got interested in, in music. So why don't you, why don't you tell, talk about that? I've always loved uh, music, anything with entertainment. Uh, much younger, as a matter of fact, uh, I had what is called a mirror at home. So every time I looked in that mirror, I don't know why I saw Clint Eastwood. Oh, you really? Know, I saw, <laughs> 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 and because Clint Eastwood, wh whenever he's in his boots or his big buckled belt and his uh, hat, he looked handsome. So to me, handsome is either dressed that way or acting cowboyish. Ah. And I kept that until this very day. I have 16 pairs of boots. Oh, that's funny. You know. <laughs> so you, you were always into movies and, um, yes. and you... You mentioned me before, so like in, in, in school in Nairobi, you actually started uh, performing in stage plays, dramas? We started, uh, we, my brother first, and then I followed in, uh, it was actually the National, uh, Kenya National Theater. Oh, wow. Yes, he took, he cast, he got the part. I followed along and for four, five years after that, we were known as the Buntanakid brothers, uh. three of us, you know three Asians, we were Fagin's gang, we were, oh, really? we were everywhere. And it was great. It was a, it was a good time. And that's why I, I think that's why I learned to sing because uh, 50 years ago, the stage that we had had three microphones that were uh, overhead. Ah, okay. You know, none of this stuff that uh, you yeah. have today, the technology you have today. So the director would always tell us to round our mouths, to say everything clearly to project the voice so that the people in the back seat can hear us. Sure, sure. So I think that's where I, I, I thank those days for. So you kind of you kind of grew up on the stage more yes, or less. I OK, did. so you end up in New York um, and were you were you playing music then? What, what happened in New York? OK, that's a shame. I, I, I went to three uh, Broadway shows. I never got myself in, in into that world which I should have, but I was busy working. I, I left school at an early age, so. But your dad wanted you to go to music school, isn't that he, right? My dad, being a diplomat, wanted me to be a diplomat son, but I ended up being a diplo brat. <laughs> and, uh, and making money, he said, as far as I could, you know, take care of myself, not get into trouble, be around him when he needed my help. I, that's it, he, he was, I may, sometimes I paint a, my wife says, why do I paint a picture of my dad being such a uh, uh, tyrant and all this? But it's not. But, but he, I grew up with a, my father having to discipline me by spanking now and again, which she would not allow me to do that to my children. Sure. You know, but uh, I, I appreciate those days. So anyway, so, but my but father it sounds like he, he was a very successful guy and he just had high standards for yes. his kids. Yeah. And, and he understood when I didn't want to go to school, don't. Be around me. I want to see what you're doing. Right. You know, if you're smoking, smoke here in front of me. I see. With your friends, what are you doing? Yeah, let me see. I see. And he was a wonderful father. So he wanted me to go to school. Um, but I, I ended up in <laughs> working in a, uh, a sandwich shop. Gotcha. It was called Blimpies. Blimpies, sure. Yeah. And the first, the first paycheck, the first week, I got in right in my hand and 108 dollars and i'd never seen that kind of money before wow and on the way home to the train station there was a music shop a pawn shop it was a pawn shop wow and i picked up the guitar it was like oh god it, it was uh it was 40 something dollars and the rest i had i gave to my mother so dad was very proud so i took that guitar that night i literally because we lived in an apartment building in, in queens i went into the closet and all the clothes and everything buffed up the sound so I studied, I put, you know, the fingering thing with the, the chart, uh, playing all the chords and everything. The next morning I came up playing Feelings. Feelings, the yes. song Feelings. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. Oh, oh, oh really? So basically one night or one, one day? One night, one night. Oh, that's and incredible. dad was like, oh my God, this kid, at last. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is it. This is what he's meant to do. He's got a path, right. So he went, a week later he came back to me, he said, look, I have an application. Uh, I put you in, enrolled uh, in the... Hebrew, Hebrew Art School of Art. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, really? 
So I go to the school and I meet this gentleman who introduced me, uh, he introduced himself to me, telling me he was a teacher, professor, but we will start next week. And a coincidentally, he would not be there for the first two, three lessons, but he would have his friend, Mr. Simon, teach me. Okay. So I'm telling my dad, dad, really, one night I, I come up with a song. Why do I need these guys teaching me these, right. these things? Why are you wasting your money? Why, what not? And so I didn't go. To, uh, only to find out later that this Mr. Simon is Paul Simon. The Paul Simon. <laughs> the Paul Simon. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. you could have you studied with the Paul Simon. I could have studied with him. I don't know what would become of it, but, but <laughs> I continue to uh, inflict pain on myself because of that, because I didn't <laughs> study with him <laughs> till Interesting. this day. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so you kept working kind of regular jobs, but you were, you were yes. playing music on the side or singing at night? Or tell me, yes. tell me about that. So... I was married, working a, a very good job. I ran, uh, uh, I was the assistant manager of a very big warehouse for um, a sports uh, wear. And uh, when I got divorced, I left that job too because I had to move back into the city. And so I, I hooked up with a, uh, sorry, gangster like. So I met up with Thai people, the Thai community, and uh, they introduced me to a lot of people who gave me jobs. Uh, so I, like any other ties, I guess, and my father had passed away a few years ago, uh, before that. So I, and I became a waiter and then a manager in Thai restaurants. Okay. I want to ask you a question about this. Do, do you feel that, uh, cause you mentioned to me earlier, your tie actually wasn't that great at this time. So you're in the States, you hook up with kind of the, the Thai community in New York. Do you think that community made you more Thai? Yes. To answer that question, uh, in that way, yes, they did. Because leaving oh, Thailand at six, seven years old, uh, growing up with uh, uh, African Indian kids, uh, I started to learn English, Swahili, and forgetting Thai. Ah, interesting. So 11 years later, now speaking fluent English, and every time mom and dad says something in Thai, we would go, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so we get to New York, become more American, I, because I was rather English before that, actually. Oh, oh you right. Know, it was a British. Right. Oh, sure, British in, uh, in, colony. In, in sure. Kenya, yeah. So becoming very American, getting married to an American lady, all American and all. And then when I get into the Thai community, of course, they would laugh at me whenever I say something which was like, no, 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 Thais don't say that. Or, no, that's not the way Thais would do Oh, this is great. Yeah. 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 And yes, so that I learned from there how to speak. Till today, and I will say it, uh, and I'm proud to say it, I do not read or write Thai. Uh, I see. But, I you, you, but you speak Thai perfectly fluently. I do speak Thai fluently, yes. Yeah. And you learn it from Thais in the States. Yes, oh, I This did. is fascinating. So, so through them, you got different kinds of jobs. And now, did you end up entertaining in these Thai places? First, I became the manager, and then, of course, at night, uh, after working, after hours, after we shut the restaurant, the staff would go out, and one day they took me out. And went Really? Are you telling me Ty's like to go out late at night with her friends after work? Uh, Is that true? Yeah, a, a few do, like, like 80% <laughs> of the time, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes, all over the world, Thai people like to do, love to do that. So we go out as they would go to Kotom places here. Sure, sure. We look, we, they would have Thai restaurants there that open after hours. Gotcha. But gotcha. they would have, of course, some drinking and a little, a little uh, music stand with, uh, with uh, singers. And because they played a song I knew, I went up and sang. And so I was hired as a singer. Ah, gotcha. Okay. After that, I was hired as the manager and oh. then hired as a bouncer. Oh, really? So, yeah. So I, through the years I, uh, in New York, I was doing... Uh, managing restaurants, uh, singing, bouncing, and pay and drawing art. Oh, oh interesting. So, yeah. So oh, wow. my my wife was very interested in or very helpful instrumenta- uh, uh, what What's that? In instrumental, in pushing me towards my my artwork. I draw portraits, so she would uh, find customers for me. Ah, I see. And I would draw these posters. Uh, which we're looking at now. You guys don't see it, but um, I, I completed them in that. one night. I didn't actually know these were your oh, portraits. Oh, my works. Oh, wow. And I finished them in one night. To me, this is fascinating because, uh, I mean, I, I knew, I, 
knew you socially, but I knew you were an actor, so I knew you had this creative kind of artistic side. But uh, it's funny that you worked as a bouncer because uh, you've got some tattoos, and I, I think you could you could do the tough guy thing. So you you, you can you can front you can look tough, but you're yeah, you're I a sensitive guy. You're I a sensitive guy. <laughs> it it worked. You know, I always just use the look and the diplomacy. I guess I learned from my father, especially yes. in, okay. <laughs> well, especially in America, when you see you see a tatted like big Asian dude, you're like, oh my god, absolutely. You know, he's like yeah. yakuza or something. <laughs> I've lost twenty kilos, but when I first came to Thailand, everybody asked where my Harley was. Oh, really? Yeah, where did you park your Harley? I'm like, no, I came on a wind motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Oh, wow. Okay, so at least you're, you, were, you weren't acting on stage, or at that point you weren't in movies, but at least right. you were entertaining. You were sure, keep, sure. keeping those skills up. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell me how you ended up coming back to Thailand. Okay, in 1995-ish, 96, my mother had returned from the States. She had lived with my brothers for a while because she was with my father there too. And when she returned, my, my sister said, you know, you're working all these jobs, odd hours, odd whatnot. You have a, you know, your son now with your, your, your now, your present wife. Come back and keep mom company. You know, I'll hire you to work in my company. Uh, she had a, a what is, marketing, uh, telemarketing. So she hired me and she said, Thailand is so, it's, everything's so cheap. You know, even, even labor, uh, you could hire a driver, not even have a car. Sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, sure. just come back. So my wife and I, uh, she's uh, originally from the Philippines, but uh, we met in New York. She'd lived in New York for a while. So, so this is your, your current wife, my your, current second, wife yes. your second wife. Yes. Right. So we looked at each other. Wow, Thailand, why not? You know, a two year vacation. <laughs> Let's go look and see if we can do it. And who knows? And who knows? It's been 27 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> so, yeah. And, that, and that's it. So we ended up here. And So you came back. And so uh, when you first came back, you were working regular jobs. Um, Beg your pardon. Yes. To answer your question about the, the acting and everything. So I, I was working with my sister doing what we called nine to five thing. But she also realized that it, it's not what I wanted. So I met up with an old friend, a guy by the name of Pro Tanapat who is a very good uh, jazz guitarist. So on many occasions, for, for, for a long while, actually, I wouldn't say occasions, for a long while, on the weekends, we would sing in different venues. We sang in many venues, avenues and whatever, from Soy 24 uh, for years. And So uh, this would have been what, like late 90s? Yes, yes, okay. because I arrived here in 96, uh. correct. And now, to go back into the acting thing, so about 97, 98, around that time, my son was in two-ish, three-ish. He was uh, spotted by casting people who, who took him in, got him a job, and then the second job, and the third job. Okay, so basically, so basically you've got a cute kid, and he gets... He gets <laughs> I have the, four cute kids. Yeah, okay. Well, your, your son starts getting these jobs like on commercials is that right yes correct okay uh and he also landed a good role in uh Suryo Thai oh really the Thai epic movie yes oh really I, I know yeah, Suryo yes. Thai of course uh, I will give you a photograph of that um so I I apparently I didn't get a part there um but during about the same time he was doing a commercial for uh Hong Kong Bank so during the casting of the the role for the father for he he got the part already so they picked me just because i was there with him and they couldn't find anybody oh, so they needed else. a dad in the commercial so they went yes, with the real correct. dad <laughs> because they said you know he was very playful with me he was very comfortable with me they were trying to cast all these uh stars i saw them coming in yeah. and it just didn't work so since then uh it's been non-stop for me that's incredible. So you get this com you get this commercial job through your son, correct? And that gets you back into acting, and you ended up doing some movies back in the day. Yes, uh, I was uh, uh, noticed by other casting people, uh, movie cast casting people, who called me and got me into uh, Broke Down Palace, um, The Beach. Oh, this is great because I know both those movies and. Uh, you know, I, I met you here. I knew that you were acting, but I, I had no idea you had been in those films. That's great. Oh, God, since then, yeah. Oh, that's great. A, a long, long so this long. is basically 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. 22 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, uh, the beach is a very unusual movie in Thai history because it's it's. You know, I, I think Leo was a star at the time, right? Um, but but that movie is so odd because it uh, it's not really about Thailand. It's this weird island thing somewhere in Asia. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But it but it does it, it does it did like put a spotlight on Southeast Asia, I think, and Correct. maybe maybe create more work. And Broke Town Palace is a good movie. I like that movie. Uh, both of them. For whatever reasons, became very political. Uh, the uh, a thorn in many people's sides, like the thing with um, with um, uh, the beach. It was something about trees being taken down, and replanted in different places, and right. you know, uh, yeah, the, right. It wasn't this, the, it wasn't environmentally sensitive. It very environmentally stuff that was. Uh, I think it was it was unco- it was money thing. Okay, <laughs> with broke down palace. Uh, I believe the, the the production had told the the uh, censor board that they were doing a documentary, uh-huh. and then when they found out it was a movie, they were asked to leave. Oh, really? So, so they took a lot of stuff, long-tailed boats, everything, and we went to the Philippines. And oh, you shot in the Philippines? Yes. Listen to us, in case you don't know, Broke Town Palace is a movie with Claire Danes Correct. about... Um, is it, An English girl. Is it two Western women? Two British girls. Yeah, yeah, two British girls who end up in a Thai prison, basically. They were caught with very little amount of uh, uh, substance right. in their backpack, and uh, they were sentenced to many, many years. Right. But right. They, they were let off. Yeah. Eventually, eventually they were yes. let off. But yeah, I uh, actually recommend that movie. I like that movie. Ah, okay. So you guys had to move to the Philippines for that. Uh, There's a little story behind that. Uh, so we went to the Philippines, uh, and the director saw me and said, you know, we have a Thai guy right here acting, so let's change it a little bit, change it up. Give him this sheet of paper, her confession, her confession. But he tells her it's a release form. Oh, I see. Yeah. (laughs) All right, action. I'm looking at the paper. I'm like, what do I do with it? He said, just read it. I said, I don't read Thai. Oh, my God. I've never heard so many Fs. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm serious. Ed was, uh, who the fuck brought the fuck to the fuck? The, who is the who, fucking Who brought tie? this Thai guy yeah. who can't read Thai? He's fucking Thai and he can't fucking read that. What the fuck is it? So, anyway, <laughs> it got... <laughs> it, there were so many fucks that my ear was getting pregnant. It, it got <laughs> to the point where I had to tell him, look, calm down. When I cast, it was just, uh, please go into the, the prison. That's uh, it. Yeah, yeah. Going to the cell. That's that's all I had to say, and I did pretty well. So he calmed down, but they got me an American guy to teach me to read in like a half hour. Oh, really? Which I couldn't do. So <laughs> needless to say, when my mother-in-law saw the movie, she said, "Don't worry, honey. You open and shut the jail door really well." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. But anyway, so you're in two big movies, and that led to other stuff. Yes. And uh, so, but but you also kind of worked regular jobs, and of course now you're managing this incredible restaurant. So uh, this uh, okay. restaurant where we're at called the Garage has been around for a long time. It used to be on uh, Wireless Road, cool. and I used to go back in the day, but that was way before I knew I knew you. Ah, uh, okay, yes. So singing alone would not have paid the bills, and so I decided because acting, well, I wasn't sure it was, was going to be the sure. the thing. So I had to come up with something else, and, and I had a little bit of money. So I said, let's open a little, uh, it was supposed to be, I believe, uh, like a, a food truck. Sure. That didn't, <laughs> didn't come to f- fruition. So I opened a restaurant, and I, I can't cook Thai food as good as the ladies on the street. I don't know what French food is. I don't know whatever. I can flip a burger, though. Oh, I see. Okay. okay? On my competition then was only Burger King and uh, McDonald's, right. who were fast food. Right. So okay, you, good. you were at the beginning of the, you really predated the the burger revolution. In the last 10 years or so, there's been an insane. Wow. Uh, More. Uh, burger Almost 20 food. years. Yeah, yeah. Almost, but, but, yeah. But you were at the beginning of that. I want to say I was one of the, the, the pioneers because there was one big one prior to me called Woodstock. Oh, Woodstock, of course. I and know they Woodstock. were good. Yeah, they apparently. were good. Apparently. No, I used to but go there they, all the they time. They shut down before I opened. Uh, and when okay. I opened, they reopened and shut down uh, briefly after that. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, but since, about two years into it, 
my God, it's not some. Uh, it's, everybody's doing. Yeah, now there's now. a million burger. It's places. become a Thai staple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, for for about twenty years, you were on uh, Wireless, wireless Road, road. Um, and now uh, they are on Sukumat Road, right opposite uh, Soy Forty Nine, right so a, a, in the corner uh, uh, of Soy Thirty Two. Corner of Soy Thirty Two. Correct. So highly recommend this place. Killer, uh, r- basically American style menu. It's, uh, it's basically kind of American burger joint, um, kind of diner style. But uh, I'm a big fan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, lure all the the neighbors in here to make it a kind of a cheers kind of a place, uh, a neighborhood spot. Uh, you don't have to come in to have a burger. You don't have to come in to have a coffee. Just come in, relax. You know, get out the hot sun, uh, use Wi-Fi, uh, whatever. It's sure. just come in. It's a very uh, comfortable kind of neighborhood style style place. Thank you. Thank so um, recently, you have been in a bunch of movies. I just, I have, I feel like every time I turn on Netflix or something, I see your face. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've been in a bunch of stuff uh, recently. So why don't you tell me about some of those? Okay, uh, through the years now, we we talked mainly about the two that I started with, but since then, with uh, uh, helping uh, students, uh, university, and all. Uh, with their thesis and, and all that, I've probably racked up about 150 productions. 150 productions? Yeah. Wait, so, okay, I didn't know anything about this. So you've been, you've been working with, uh, what, drama students? Yes, if they come to me and say, people, would you help us? You know, we need just somebody who's been in the movies to try to uh, boost our... Oh, I see, uh, oh, I see. So you've been doing... It, it, it. You've been in these kind of like lower budget kind of sure, student level sure, productions. Sure, sure, So you've been, in, you've been in, you think, 150. That's crazy. I would say, yeah. Oh, so with the been... Tyler Corn and everything. Oh, yes. I see. So you're you you've been kind of more or less constantly acting, whether it's yes. for like uh, pennies or whether it's good yes. money. You just keep Free, busy. Free, whatever. I'll do it. Keep uh, busy. Oh, that's great. On IMDb, you probably have about eighty. Uh, oh my god! But, uh, I, I, this also I didn't know. I had no uh, idea it was that many. <laughs> that's incredible. I've worked with everybody from Leonardo to uh, Pierce Brosnan, Ryan Gosling, Kevin Bacon, Angelina Jolie. Oh, I mean, wow. I think I have a good. Uh, uh, resume uh, as far as uh, um, uh, people I've worked with in uh, the A-listers I've worked with. That's so. great. Now, in the last couple of years, you were in uh, Bangkok Breaking, which was a Netflix series. Uh, original Thai right. Netflix, yes. Right. And you're also in um, the Ron Howard movie about the cave rescue called 13 Lives. Correct. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, I think any actor would be... Um, happy excited proud to work with a, a director like ron howard and it, it, you know this is to the point where when i was uh, shooting with him i would talk to my wife every day ron howard ron howard she said stop it already you know <laughs> <laughs> you you just over you know sens- sensationalizing the guy uh, but it's true so you know oh, so this shoot was in australia is that correct uh i dare say and i, I believe i'm permitted to say about 90 plus 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 percent was shot in australia gotcha. on, on the gold coast yeah uh, and we were we spent three months there and had a blast ah. yes uh i rec- i highly recommend it because uh uh yes because i'm in it uh but <laughs> because the the a a listers are people like vigo mortensen uh colin farrell joel edgerton it's actually and very well done. You it's know, very well done. We, we, you know, on the podcast, we've talked about a bunch of the different cave stories. And I, I got to be honest with you, I have not seen a bad. I mean, for one thing, the raw material of the story is so incredible. I haven't sure. seen a a bad one, so I kind of like and support them all. But um, the uh, obviously the, the the Hollywood one with Ron Howard and like the big budget and the real actors. It's very well done. And I, then- think, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, when any, any, any situation like this happens, uh, people buy out the rights to certain people and all sure. that. Um, in our case, we had the rights to the main divers who found the kids. Gotcha. So it was very easy for these adults in their uh, right frame of mind to uh, recount all the people they met how they met the children, how they met everybody. And sure. Ron told their story really, really well. I mean, uh, like people like to say that you know the story, you know the outcome, but yet you were at the edge of your seat. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, yeah. the sounds that he put into the people while they were diving, you know, the tanks hitting on the sides of the rocks and everything. Oh, so 
uh, amazing. Anyway, I'm yeah. glad I'm glad you had that experience. It, yes, thank the you. The bottom line is you it sounds like you've earned it over the years. You've been in so many different productions. You you've been you've been doing the work as I they can, say. I continue to and I continue to learn. And people always say, which was the hardest, which was the best, which did you love most? And I, I, I answer it very stupidly by saying the next one. Uh. Because seriously, there there's so many lines to remember, there's so many people to remember, so I forget them. Uh, so right. I just concentrate on the next one. Gotcha. On what's coming and and if I can do it well, uh, that's it. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think it uh, might be time to wrap it up. Uh, okay. So I just want to say uh, thanks for doing this. Um, we want to keep uh, in touch with you with your career. So uh, m- maybe in the future you can come back on the show. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you for having me this time. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, you've been on this great, what I, like kind of multicultural adventure. I always tell people that um, Thailand is more diverse than it looks and uh you know I, I think you're a good example of that with your background of living in africa when you tell me you lived in africa i, I almost thought you were joking like the first time <laughs> you said like oh i lived in africa for what was it 11 years 10 years 11 years yeah i, I was like okay he's not doing the doing the best times seriously when when like i said the dollar was eight shillings oh wow it's probably a hundred something shillings now right so yep. econ- economy and everything is is not at its best now but it was then yeah, Thailand is filled with interesting people like Poo. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I thank you, Ed. Thank you. And hope to see you again. Stop by, bring more friends to the garage, all of you. Thank you. For sure. We'll be back. Man, that was a great interview. What a story. What? I like, I ah, man. I, his he, life is just, his life is just a weird twist and turns and, it's just fascinating to hear him talk about it. Yeah, you know, I've only met Bo once. I don't know if he would remember me, but I was at it was at the garage at his place on, which is on the corner of Sukhumvit Thirty Two and uh, corner of Sukhumvit Thirty Two, right? Um, right. Yeah. And, sure. Uh, it's it's a great little place, and yeah, man, like you meet him, and I, he's immediately likable. He was just so friendly and nice right. and funny and cool, and I wanted to sit down with him when I met him. I was like, this guy's something I'd love, someone I'd love to talk to. Um, yeah, he's um, he's very likable. Got a lot of charisma. But, you know, my take from talking to him and, you know, it's him, but also hearing about his family is they're just so damn talented. And it's, it's, it's funny because my, you know, my my thing has always been I did well in school. I was a lawyer. Then I, you know, now I teach and everything I do is about being analytical and it's all about, you know, whatever, like ideas or whatever. And then it's and then I just meet people like Boo, or obviously we have other friends who they can sing, they can dance, they can play guitar. And it's just like, it's just, I can't do that. It's like, it's, it's like right. they just, I feel like they just have a magic power. That's how, that's how I interpret like my friends who, who act. I'm like, what? It's like, they have something, they have just some weird, <laughs> like they have some weird juice that I don't have. I'm like, what, how do you do this? And then, you know, in the interview, I just looked up at the walls on the second floor of the garage and there's all these awesome sketches and I'm like, Oh, where'd these come from? You know, and you know, in the interview you can, you can hear it. Like, he's just like, Oh, these are mine. So like, it's like, so he's like <laughs> guitar player, singer, actor. Oh, and he's also, Oh, he, I just happened to draw these great sketches as well. Yeah. But does he have an English language podcast in uh, Bangkok? I That's think right. So. I don't think he's got anything like the Bangkok podcast. Yeah, my message to Boo is you might be super talented and handsome and multidisciplinary uh, uh, master of many arts, but uh, you're just uh-huh. just be happy that me and Ed are so fantastically handsome and talented in our own ways. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We got we got this going on. <laughs> All I can think of is Millhouse's line going, my mom thinks I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, again, I mentioned it in the interview, but... Uh, the restaurant that he and his wife have, uh, he and his wife Joy have, is great. Um, so I highly recommend the garage. Uh, as Greg said, it's on the corner of Sukhumvit 39, or right there on the corner. Uh, and it's basically an American, but not really a pub. It's more of an American kind of a deli sandwich shop. Good burgers. Uh, they do have a, yeah, good burgers. They, they, but they have a fairly broad menu. And uh, it's just a cool place to hang out. Uh, and they... Um, they actually were one of the first kind of Western burger places because the garage has been around for a while. It used to be on uh, with you. Um, it's been around for a while. So they actually predate all the more recent burger joints. Right. They used to be an all seasons place, right? I used to uh, have that lunch. That is correct. I used to have lunch there back in my go to days. 
That is correct. No, that was a really cool interview, man. And um, it was it must have been amazing to be able to work with Ron Howard on such a high profile uh, movie with a lot of talented people from all around the world. Yeah, I know. I mean, he, you know, he's been in many movies. Um, you know, uh, the, I mean, this is this is the life of the actor. I mean, you and I both know many actors. You have done some acting, and you know, we've both worked as extras and stuff. You have and to use quote marks in, when you say acting when it first. I mean, <laughs> what I've done, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Some of your stuff is classic. I've seen some clips. <laughs> it's classic. No, but I mean, we, we like, you and I both know that actors just they got to put their time in, man. Like yeah. bit parts here and there, like five minutes of this, two minutes. Like you don't have a speaking line, and then you finally get a speaking line, and then you just move up the chain, and. Um, Boo just has put the time in, and uh, now he's got dozens of credits, and he's in um, major Hollywood films. So, you know, fingers crossed that he that he can go even higher and do more work because uh, he's got the talent. There's no doubt about that. True that. Yeah, great conversation, and thanks, Boo, for coming on. And I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you again at at the garage. I'll come by, have a burger, and hopefully we can sit down and uh, have a conversation. For sure, we got to do it. Yeah, thanks, totally. Boo. All right, let's get into some Love, Loathe, or Live With, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we discuss to decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. Now, last week, we did a segment of Would You Rather, where we discussed Thai funerals versus Western funerals. So this week, let's shake things up a bit, and uh, it is Ed's turn. So Ed, what do you have for me? All right, well, having recently been in Pattaya and been, of course, at a Thai hotel, I was reminded of one of my 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 pet peeves. One of this is it might even be in the top five now of things I don't like about Thailand. Ooh. How hard how hard the damn mattresses are. Yeah, we did that already. Right. Yeah, heck We're- yeah. But I've got something else for you, which is is it's kind of a compliment to this, mm. and I'm just curious if you have formed an opinion. Okay. Now now, previously we have talked about the odd triangle pillow. Thing. that's <laughs> yeah. part of Thai culture, yeah. right? Like, so well, only I'm not Thais talking about that. Pillow and add I'm not talking about it. right. I'm not talking about that. But do you have any take or opinion on just the average Thai pillow in a hotel? So we've already done the mattress. So do you have oh, any take on just pillows? I file, find them to be wildly inconsistent because I like pillows that are dense. Like I like the type of pillows that if you get into a pillow fight, you'll knock the other guy onto his ass. Right. And, <laughs> and I need 1.5 pillows, not two, not one, 1. 1.5. So okay. it's I'm not hard sure what for that me means. to get. I don't, know, yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah. What does that mean? Try, try to be me. It's not easy for me to find a pillow or pillows that I can comfortably use. So I find it to be an incredibly un- unpredictable crapshoot. Interesting. Um, here's, here's my take. Thai pillows in general as far as I'm concerned, tend to be kind of overstuffed, such as that I, you know, I lay down on the bed, which of course the mattress is too hard, but then my neck is arched too high. It's like the pillows don't, they're not soft. You don't, you don't collapse into the pillow. They're like overstuffed. Now you're a bigger dude. So it's possible that the, the, the average overstuffed pillow might fit you better. But uh, it's funny that while I was in Pati and I, you know, we I was with a, you know, a group of friends. This topic came up, and everyone was on the same boat. We're like, yeah, like where are other soft pillows that you can just, like a pillow you're supposed to like really? collapse into, like a pillow no. you're supposed to collapse into. No, but no, a no. lot of Thai pillow, a lot of Thai pillows are just they're overstuffed. They're too, they're too strong. No, man, I got to meet these friends of yours. Actually, I probably know them, but no, the mattress you're supposed to collapse into, the pillow is is supposed to provide support. If you have a pillow that you collapse into, you might as well not even have a pillow. Oh, I got to disagree on this. Um, So, so, but, so your problem is not so much, uh, your problem is just inconsistency. It's not, so you don't have a fixed opinion about Thai pillows other than that you'd think they're unreliable. Well, you know, we could also get into this really deep, Ed, because it also depends on how you sleep. Like, if you sleep on your back or your stomach, I can see where a pillow that's too high would be problematic. But I sleep on my side, so I'm uh, a little bit higher. So I prefer uh, a pillow that's overstuffed. Interesting. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm gonna. I'm just going to have to go loathe on this. Just to, to me, the pillows match the mattresses. They're like too, they're overstuffed. They're too hard. Come on. Like, give me some comfort here. That's that's what I'm paying for. <laughs> no, I, I like I like the overstuffed pillows. I'm a love for that. That's what I that's what I like. Oh, geez, yeah, that's 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 pure craziness. But it is what it is. We we it's don't right. have to agree on everything. We can still be friends. 
We don't have to share a pillow. <laughs> We're not That's that right. good friends. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God we don't have to share pillows. <laughs> all righty. A final thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, you can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show. I dumped Twitter, but you can now find me on Mastodon at pkkgreg at home.social. So thank you for listening, folks, and we will see you back here next week. For sure.